Welcome to This Week from Blue Mountain Broadcasting. I'm Linnell Ellis, president of Blue Mountain Broadcasting Association and your host for the show. And I'm so glad that you have tuned in. Today we will be sharing a devotional thought and I'm going to be interviewing Darcy Wiesman from the Umatilla National Forest. And I'm really excited about talking with her about how we can use our forests this summer. And then I'll be sharing with you some of the biggest updates about what's happening at Blue Mountain Broadcasting Association, including the total that we raised in our summer fundraiser. So stay tuned for that coming up as well. Let's start with our devotional thought. You know, sometimes we need to go against culture or we need to kind of go against what is normally accepted in order to actually be following God's will. When Jesus passed through Samaria on his way to Galilee, he was doing something that other Jews would have certainly avoided. They would have taken the longer route. He was going against culture. Those other Jews would have gone on that longer route that was east of the Jordan River in order to avoid contact with the Samaritans, who of course they considered to be polluted people. These people had intermarried with other pagan nations, and so the Jews were viewing them as not really God's true children anymore, even though they had all originally been from Israel. And these people had been from the 10 northern tribes, all descended from Jacob, or his other name, Israel. In fact, in this story that we're talking about today, it is so interesting that it's taking place at Jacob's well, that father of the nation of Israel. And in this place, Jesus paused to rest. This well had been dug centuries earlier by the revered patriarch we were just talking about, the revered patriarch, Jacob. And Jesus stopped here on purpose. He had a spiritual appointment with one very, very special person. Of course, she didn't know about the appointment, but he did. And as the disciples went into town to buy food, Jesus met this Samaritan woman at Jacob's well. It was midday and she was likely drawing water during the heat of the day to avoid contact with other women who would have come earlier in the day to get their water while it was still cooler. This Samaritan woman apparently did not have a good reputation. Now, Jesus initiated a conversation with her by asking her for a drink of water. Let's continue the story by reading a short section from the book, Messiah. It goes like this. The woman saw that Jesus was a Jew. She was so shocked that he would speak to her that she forgot to give him a drink. She could only ask, why would you ask me for a drink since you're a Jewish man and I am a Samaritan woman. Jesus answered, you're surprised that I would ask you something so small as a drink of water from this well. If you had asked me, I would have given you a drink of the living water of eternal life. And Jesus went on in his conversation with the Samaritan woman. He wanted to reach her heart and let her know that even though she had a dark past and even though she had been judged harshly by others, he, he was not here to judge her, but instead he was here to offer her salvation and infinite love. And he talked with her about her five husbands. And then she changed the subject. So he talked with her about true worship of God. And uh, he refused to get into a debate with her about whether worship should be in Jerusalem or on Mount Gerizim. And he explained to her that true worship happens in spirit and in truth, not in a particular place. Again, let's lead, read a little bit more from the book Messiah. The woman was impressed with Jesus. No one had ever said such things to her. Remembering the sins of her past had made her aware again of how much was missing from her life. This conversation had made her realize that she had a desperate need for God's love in her life. Even though Jesus knew the dark secrets of her life, she could still feel his friendship, his love for her. His purity condemned her sins, but he did not condemn her. An amazing thought came to her mind. 
Could this person be the promised one, the Messiah? I know the Messiah is coming, she said, and when he is here, he will explain everything to us. And Jesus said, I am he, I, the one talking to you. Now, this event that we've just been talking about and reading about happened really early in Jesus' ministry. And this was the first time that he revealed to someone directly who he really was. And Jesus chose to tell a Samaritan and a woman first. It was a very counterculture thing to do, but it was God's love for all humanity demonstrated. So we should watch for appointments and opportunities to connect with others, other people that God has in mind for us, knowing that they may often be outside of our regular path and outside perhaps of our comfort zone. Please stay tuned. I'll be right back. And welcome back to this week from Blue Mountain Broadcasting. Joining me now is Darcy Wiesman from the Umatilla National Forest. And I am really excited to be talking with you today about this wonderful resource that we have here in our valley. Well, up from the valley <laughs> into the mountains. So uh, first of all, tell us a little bit about what the forest includes. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I work for the Umatilla National Forest, and many of you commonly know part of um, the Umatilla is the Northern Blues, or you know of the Blue Mountains, and we make up part of the Blue Mountains. The Umatilla itself uh, is, consists of 1.4 million acres, so it's a, quite a good chunk of land. Uh, it is a very long and narrow and diagonal forest, so we span into the state of Washington as well as a good portion of our forest is in the state of Oregon. So opportunities in both states and across 11 counties and elevations that range anywhere from 1,600 feet above sea level to 8,000 feet above sea level. So as you can imagine, with that kind of diversity, there's just uh, lots of ecosystems, lots of different landscapes that you can look at and explore and experience and also a, a equally diverse amount of recreation opportunities on the forest for people to enjoy. Certainly. So how do people, gen what are some of the things people do when they head out to our forest? Yeah, we have a lot of recreation opportunities. Really, it's endless and it's year-round. So people can explore and enjoy their national forest any time of the year. Uh, summertime is a really popular time on the Umatilla National Forest. Uh, lots of people like to go hiking or backpack trips, uh, camping, biking, motorcycles, ATVs, UTVs. You can fish, uh, go just view some beautiful wildflowers or pick um, wild edibles like mushrooms or huckleberries. Mm -hmm. So really just uh, a lot of opportunities there. Um, we've got three wild and scenic rivers so you can enjoy some rafting. Um, you know, we've got four different lakes on the forest, so boating or kayaking, um, any of those kind of opportunities. So just, just a wide, diverse range um, that people can enjoy. Excellent. So talk with us about what is open and available. Yeah, you know, that's a really common question that we're getting right now. A lot of people are looking to get outdoors and enjoy some fresh air, yes. um, find great ways to just be in nature and away from other people. And um, the good news is most of the forest is open right now and accessible. So there's just a, a wide variety of opportunities where people can get out there and do a variety of things. Uh, a common a question I get is around trails. Hiking is something people like to go and enjoy and they wanna know where they can go in the forest. And most of our trails are open, uh, specifically looking like at the Walla Walla Ranger District, which is right here in most people's backyard. So the area of the forest they're probably most familiar with. Most all our trails are open. Some of the higher elevation trails uh, may have some obstructions or debris in the roads. Our recreation crews have been quite busy and so they haven't quite got to those ones yet. So we just let people know, hey, plan ahead and, and contact the forest and ask. Or a really great resource that some people don't realize is available is on our website. We actually have every single trail in the forest listed and each has its own page with all sorts of information, whether that's the elevation of the trail, the difficulty level, um, if it's open accessible, the current condition, and we're updating that on a weekly basis, and uh, the, how to get to the trailhead, directions to get there, and then there's a really neat interactive map on the web as well where you can zoom in and 
really hone in on that area to learn, you know, what you know what you can do in that area. It also talks about other activities in that area. So just a, a resource I highly recommend before people head out. Um, but most of those trails are open and accessible outside of, of course, um, the trails that are within areas where we had flood damage this yeah, year. Yeah, I, I was just going to ask you about that because it would seem like those the, the crew that you have for getting the trails all cleaned up would be extra busy this year. Yes, our trail crews are extra busy this year in addition to, you know, trying to get our trails open. They're also trying to get campgrounds open. And then on top of that, of course, we had this historic flood event happen back in February on February 6th. It's ingrained in my head. Yeah, um, huge flood. Like huge 100 flood. Year flood. It was, yeah. yeah. And, you know, um, devastated many of our communities, both in Oregon and Washington, and lots of homes lost or, se you know, severely damaged. And, and the forest experienced substantial damage as well, uh, primarily in three different watersheds on the forest, uh, the Toucannon River watershed, Mm -hmm. the South Fork Walla Walla River watershed, which is a quite popular area, and then the Umatilla River watershed. And uh, we were able to fly those areas pretty quickly after the flood, and um, there was just sections where the roads or trails were just completely gone. Yep, and there's debris, slides, and obstructions in many areas, just rock beds all over <laughs> yes. where the road used to be. And so there's substantial damage in those roads and trails in those areas. So we put together a long-term temporary closure. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> Which is an interesting term for it me, long-term temporary. Yes, yes, and, and what that means is that we know it's gonna take us a while to fix those areas. And we are working on it, we intend to lift those closures, but we have to get those critical repairs done um, so that they're safe for people to go and enjoy those areas. In other words, the plan is to open it up, but it's just gonna take a while to it get it will. fixed. It <laughs> will, yeah, yeah. We were fortunate uh, that we were approved for emergency federal funding to do those repairs and we anticipate starting really the the heart of those repairs this summer we have been able to do some work in the two cannon river road and we opened that back up just a few weeks ago up to the two cannon campground so we could open the two cannon campground so that was really great we we're able to do that but it's probably going to be a long a long road ahead um, we're thinking it'll take a couple years to get all that repair work done and we know people are eager to get out there and we're really eager to get those areas open as well. But it, it will take some time for us to go through the actual site specific survey process we have to do, um, which is recording all of the damage at each of those sites, um, what it would take to repair it and the cost estimates to then send and get that, that federal funding to do the work. So, mm -hmm. yeah. You know, one of the big questions that I've heard sort of tossed around among friends and acquaintances is what about Jubilee Lake? Is it going to be open and when will it be open? Yeah, so I've got great news there then because okay. Jubilee Lake Campground is opening tomorrow. Uh -huh. So we're that actually is the day that people will be watching this. It'll be today. So oh. since we're recording this a day ahead. OK, so. well, Jubilee Lake is open so July, July 2nd. Two. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep, and so just in time for the 4th of July, Jubilee Lake is open, and we're really excited about that. Uh, rumor has it Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife just stocked the lake as well. Oh. So if people are looking to go fishing, uh -huh. uh, that may be a good spot, and uh, probably good chances you're gonna catch something. Yes. Um, so yeah, we're happy we're able to get that campground open. People should expect the water may not be on, so bring your own adequate supply of water to drink or and the ability to boil and purify your own water. Mm -hmm. um, but so yeah. do we know, will the water be on later in the season? Yep, yep, mm -hmm. we will get the water turned on later in the season. It's just one of those pieces of getting a campground open that our rec crews haven't quite gotten taken care of yet. Yes, Yeah. so come prepared. Come prepared. Maybe some other supplies you might need, toilet paper, that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So typically our campgrounds, you know, they do have amenities like restrooms and those will be open. Uh, but just knowing the that we have, you know, our ability to routinely service them and we're expecting peak numbers this weekend. Do the fourth of July is always a really popular yes. time at Jubilee Lake. So we recommend people come with their own personal hygiene supply, including hand sanitizer yes. and then toilet paper, uh, just in case there's no toilet paper in the restrooms. Um, so those are always good supplies to, to have on hand um, in addition to the drinking water and garbage bags. So that way you can pack out anything that you bring with you, help us really keep that campground in, in good condition, so. Excellent. And um, we, 
I wanted to talk a little bit about what what we can do with motorized vehicles because there's some trails that are just for walking, some with motorized vehicles. Mm -hmm. Can you talk to us a little bit about that and how we know? Yeah, absolutely. So we have over 2,000 miles of roads in the forest for uh, motorized use as well as over 250 trails. So quite a big network. Of course, that's spread out over the entire forest with, uh, with those different road networks. But we do have what we call in the forest travel management and motor vehicle use maps. And those display where people can go with a motorized vehicle and what type of motorized vehicle could go on that road or trail. So we have this really great resource that I highly encourage people to access and they're called motor vehicle use maps. Mm -hmm. We update them annually. And there's some ATVs there. there the yeah, well, right on the cover, yeah. <laughs> and uh, they display for people the open road network that's available for motorized use. So there's not a whole lot else on this map in terms of landmarks, and it does not show roads or trails that are not motorized. It really is showing you this is the motorized road you can go on or trail. Mm -hmm. And then if you can take a motorcycle or if you can take a UTV or a highway legal vehicle even. Uh, they're available free of charge. And um, in addition to hard copy, they're also available either on our website or uh, through the Avenza app. And um, it, they're free on the Avenza app. The benefit of downloading it there is that it's geo-referenced. And so okay. when you're out in the woods, it works offline. So how do you get the app? Uh, you can just go to the App Store and look up Avenza. Okay. And it's a free app. And you can install our motor vehicle use maps on that. Um, and it's geo-referenced, so when you're out in the woods, you can actually see where you are in relation to the map and if you're on an open road. Yes. Um, so I recommend that. I also recommend if people are wanting a hard copy that they also get a visitor use map, which we have district level maps, which are really the best ones, and then the forest wide map. And uh, these are available to purchase for $14, and they're really a great navigation tool. Okay, so what you have right there is the Walla Walla Ranger District, and you would get that at the office? Or on our website. Either one. Yeah. Okay, you can order it on the website and have yep. it come to you? Okay. Yep. Yep, they should still be available via the National Map Store, um, which is on our website, or they can contact us and we can mail those to people too. Okay, so, what yeah. great resources. Yeah. And last question, is it time for huckleberry picking yet? Oh, huckleberries are pretty delicious. <laughs> they <laughs> are. Um, Tedious to pick, but delicious. It takes quite a bit of time. Um, picking is actually not my favorite, but I love eating them, so <laughs> it's worth here. it. It's worth it. Uh, so huckleberries typically come on and are ripe to pick about mid to end of July, so they're a little early yet, mm -hmm. um, but it is a, a really fun pastime. Tollgate has them all over up in that area. Yes. Um, our offices too, we usually hear, hear from folks if they're starting to find them, so if you call, uh, we'll often be able to help and let you know if we're hearing the, the, rough, the huckleberries are ripe to pick. So um, not Good. quite yet, uh, getting close though, we're in July now, so the huckleberries should be on soon. Excellent. Darcy, I want to thank you so much for sharing this important information with us. And I really hope that you'll take advantage of the forest that we have available. Get outside, get some fresh air and exercise and enjoy the beautiful natural world that we have around us. Thanks again. Yeah, thanks for having me. And stay tuned. I'll be right back. Welcome back. It's time for Station News. The big news that you've probably been waiting for this entire program is for me to tell you what the total is from our summer fundraiser. And we finished the fundraiser up on Tuesday evening with a total of $23,310. So thank you. We are praising God for that and thanking you for your contributions to Blue Mountain Broadcasting Association. Fantastic. We had such a great time. Also, we wanted to let you know that we have some new programs coming to Blue Mountain Television and they are from the Voice of Prophecy. We don't know exactly when the first air date for these will be because we're still finishing the contractual negotiations between Blue Mountain Broadcasting Association and Voice of Prophecy, but the programs will be one called Disclosure, which is going to be on at 4 p.m. on Saturdays, and we have one called Heaven's Call, which will be on at 9 p.m. on Tuesdays. So two new shows to look forward to here on Blue Mountain Television. And you probably need a little update about Secret Life of the Desert. And I've, I needed an update too, so I've just been talking with Daniel Biggs about it. And yes, they did go to the San Juan Islands looking for that rare butterfly, but they were just a little late to catch the butterfly. The butterfly's favorite flowers had already pretty much bloomed out 
However, they found a lot of really interesting other creatures, plants, and um, all kind of stuff. So it was very interesting. And the highlight of that was that they were able to get some footage of the silver fox. And so I'm excited to, to see all about that as this footage comes out with Secret Life of the Desert. And an update about our new facility as well. We told you last time that we were having a little slowdown with the tower base and some engineering issues with that. Well, we have really great news that we just received, and that is that our new tower base that's going to fit the hole that we've prepared for it is on the truck and headed to us, and it should arrive by Friday, July 3. So really, really good news for all of us as we are taking that kind of first step toward getting the new facility on Wallula Road ready for broadcasting. And I want to encourage you to participate with Blue Mountain Television, of course, through your prayers and also through your donations and gifts to the station. Many of you pledged during our summer fundraiser. We thank you for that. Some of you may not have got in on that, but you'd still like to do something for Blue Mountain Television, which of course we would greatly benefit from. So um, your donations are certainly welcome. And if you want to get in touch with us, be sure you do that and connect with us so that you can find out what's going on with our quarterly newsletter, our weekly emails, and then through this show as well. So uh, I look forward to seeing you next week when we'll be back again with another episode of This Week from Blue Mountain Broadcasting. It's been great spending this time with you. See you next time.